Hola, soy Elder Favarín. Gracias por escuchar este podcast. Espero que te inspire y te haga reflexionar. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I hope you are enjoying this gathering as much as our family is. Certainly, our kids are having a lot of fun. They are having such fun that we were humbly wanting to suggest we extend the gathering for a month, if at all possible, <laughs> with amazing people, extraordinary place, such a marvelous hospitality in Croatia. What a gift from God. Well, you saw two of our kids, but if I may show this other picture, from our recent Saturday, I was speaking elsewhere, and Anna, my wife, sent the picture from our kids, our three boys, play soccer at our local team, and Valentina was coming from a gymnastics uh, competition. So Anna sent me that picture just after their events. Would you agree with me when I say that as a dad, as a mom, we love seeing our children together? And if there is one thing that upsets us and hurts us is seeing our children arguing or fighting amongst themselves. Well, in our family that only happened once, but I hear it is every two hours. And mainly when we grow up, if there is something that hurts us deeply is seeing our most intimate relationships with my brother or my sister or my dad or my mom or between dad and mom being divided in tension, not embracing the unity that there should be there. Of course, we can say the same about our Heavenly Father. And one of his followers, perhaps the most influential follower of Christ in history, the Apostle Paul, was hurting for this lack of unity among one of the local expressions of God's church in Corinth. And therefore, he focuses a good portion of his first letter to the Corinthians, speaking in awe, exhorting them because of the divisions they were experiencing. We've heard our Bible passage for today. Allow me to just give some additional introduction and also to briefly describe our map for the following minutes as I want to begin in this passage and then open up three other passages as they help us to apply further what we are learning in 1 Corinthians. Would that be okay? Even if you said, no, this is what I have prepared. So, <laughs> Paul writes to the church in Corinth to address some big problems. Division. And I, I'm sure none of us can relate to that in our local expressions of churches and teams. But I hope you make an effort to make the right connections this morning. But there was also sexual misconduct confusion about food and worship practices, controversy surrounding Jesus' resurrection. And Paul is saying, Jesus is alive. He is at the center. We must go back to the gospel. But God raised Jesus from the dead to solve and speak into these very practical issues. So from 1 Corinthians 1.10 to 421. He's dealing specifically with divisions, lack of unity in this local church. For example, in chapter 1, verse 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly united in mind and in thought. Paul had planted this church just a few years prior to writing this letter. They were, of course, physical adults, but Paul addresses them as spiritual babies. 
probably writing from Ephesus. He's showing us how there was rivalry, competition between those who viewed themselves as related to Paul, others related to Apollos. In chapter 3, verse 4 and chapter 3, verse 5, the names of Paul and Apollos appear already, though reversed. First Apollos, then Paul. It seems to us that from the beginning, Paul is saying, it's either Apollos first or me first. However, I want to show you that you are misleading. You are missing the focus. You are struggling for control. Who is the boss here? Who really holds authority? Who calls the shots? Who is right? But therefore, you are really missing the point. And Paul is therefore developing an agricultural metaphor as a way of explaining to the Corinthians how God's work is accomplished. And he pictured the Corinthians as a fertile field. And as we have read the key verse that was given to us for this time together this morning, Paul is saying, well, one of us may have planted I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. Just a note on the original Greek, these are complete past tense. So I planted the seed, done. Apollos watered it, done. Things that, by the way, other people could have done. Mary could have planted, John could have watered. These are Human beings doing something that others could do. But God. But God. And this is a better translation. Has been making it grow. The original verb is in the continuous. I planted, Apollos watered, but God is doing what only God can do. God is making it grow. Let's refocus. Let's look up. Let's be together. Let's stop focusing on people. Let's focus on God. And let us notice that it is God who deserves the applauses, the glory, and the loyalty from each one of us. Now, I'm sure these issues, as I said before, don't happen to us in our town, cities, groups, teams, ministries, local churches in Europe. But we hear it happens in other parts of the world. So for their benefit, allow me to highlight how by emphasizing these words, the Apostle Paul or God through Paul is calling us to unity, calling us to humility, and calling us to rest. Because of this, but God, we are called together to unity, to humility, and to rest. First, to unity, which is very clear from the context where Paul is very upset about the divisions in this church. And we cannot but be reminded that the Lord that Paul followed, the Lord of this church, was the one who clearly emphasized how crucial and vital the unity of his family is. Come with me, for example, to John chapter 17. Verse 20, in John 17, we find the largest record of a prayer made by Jesus. From verses 1 to 5, he prays for himself. From verses 6 to 19, Jesus prays for his disciples, those in front of him back then. In verse 20, now Jesus looks to the future And he prays for you and for me 
those who would follow him as a result of the apostolic preaching. Notice that Jesus is then lifting his eyes to the Father and says, John 17, 20, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And then you think, wow, Jesus is going to pray for all the millions upon millions of women and men who will follow him across the world. What will he pray about? So much to ask the Father for us. What would you pray for the church around the world? Having the possibility of asking about anything, this is what Jesus prays for. Verse 21. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What does Jesus pray for? Unity. No surprise, it was so important to the Apostle Paul to focus paragraphs upon paragraphs of his important letter to confront the division. John here is giving us a window to the heart of our Lord. Imagine yourself living that moment with Jesus, his last hours, after the last supper, before his crucifixion, longest prayer, when he asks the Father for you and for me and for ECM and his church with big C around the world and says, may they be one. I pray for their unity. What is God's will for our lives? What is in God's heart for us? Certainly, our unity as a family is at the core of God's heart. We must remember, are you all with me? That unity, because Christ has risen and sent his spirit, is already a fact. Listen up. We do not produce unity. We are already one in Christ. We manifest. We live according to the unity we already have in Christ. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the influential German pastor and theologian who was killed for conspiring against Hitler, wrote, Christian community is not an ideal we have to realize, but rather a reality created by God in Christ in which we may participate. Paul, writing in Ephesians 4, 3, says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, called to God. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all. All and through all, in all. Very intentional in his vocabulary to remind us because God raised Christ from the dead and he sent his spirit. He made us a family. We are one. The question, however, is whether we live according to that unity. And it seems to me that Jesus' prayer was answered by the Father already in a way by calling men and women around the world to become one in Christ. But it is being answered as well as we become answers to Jesus' prayer and we live according to the unity we already have. Imagine my son Raffaello wakes up tomorrow and says, Dad, I am tired of Matteo, my brother. Can we please stop being brothers? Is there anything I can do about that? 
may, they, they, they may never speak to each other again. God forbid this to happen. They may even desire that the other one wouldn't even exist. Would that change their identity? Their brotherhood? No. They are brothers. And there is nothing you can do about that. On the contrary. Jesus is saying, therefore, live according to the unity you already have. Remember, there is no single child in the life, in the family of God. Though some of us live as if, as if we were single child, single missions, single local churches, single denominations, single theological spectrums. No, we have brothers and sisters. I like the imagery of a bicycle wheel to portray our connection. You may be in different points of the wheel. But we are all connected by the Spirit to the center that is Christ. If we are truly in Christ and Christ is in us. Though there can be some differences among us, of course. And the question that I should be asking myself and can I please invite you to ask yourself as well is, are we, of course, among this segment of God's family called ECM, but more broadly, where we serve, where we live, expressing and living according to the unity we have in Christ? Is our unity a, listen up please, priority? I live in Granada and I won't name any names, but I have been amazed at the fact that there are leaders in our city that never attend the pastor's meeting, pastor's breakfast, let's get together and do something together. I want to respectfully ask them, what gospel are you embracing if you don't grasp the center, the, how vital the promotion? I, I know you are my brother. And I, I am the first one to repent and ask God to help me. But come on, let's live according to our unity. It is not a choice. Our Lord expressed how central and necessary it is. To live according to the unity he's given us. And of course, the text is giving us the model. Jesus, the Father and the Spirit, God is our model of unity. He says, may they be one as we are one. It is a beautiful thing to realize from John 16, 14, that the Holy Spirit is glorifying the Son. That in John 17, 4, the Son is glorifying the Father. That in chapter 17, verse 1, the Father is glorifying the Son. As Tim Keller has described this, each of the divine persons centers upon the others. None demands that the others revolve around him. Each voluntarily circles the other too. Pouring love, delight, and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity, though this is not a biblical term, it is a term that helps us to try to describe who God is. If you need further clarification of how the Trinity works, talk to Simon, please. <laughs> and the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the others. That creates, Keller says, a dynamic, pulsating dance of joy and love. What a beautiful picture. C.S. Lewis, before Keller, said, It is a kind of dance. The pattern of this three-personal life is the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. God is a relationship. He is one in a relationship from everlasting to everlasting. And he calls us to dance to his music, having the other at the center, God, first of all, and living according to the unity we already have in Christ and with each other.
reminding us that our churches are not the kingdom. ECM is not the kingdom. Though I may pastor, it is not my church. It is Christ's church. No, I can be a pastor, but I do not have any sheep. Jesus said to Peter, look after my sheep. That though I mentor and help other people, I do not have disciples. Jesus told me, go and make disciples of who? Of Christ. We are disciples of Christ. We are sheep of Christ. We are the church of Christ. We are the mission of Christ. It's not uniformity. It's diversity as we find in the Trinity. Indifference, someone has said, is the opposite of love. And we are called in a world that is growing in its polarization. Where we may even kill each other because you wear a mask and I don't wear a mask. If you take a vaccine and I don't take a vaccine. If you vote right or you vote left. If you think this or you think that. God reminds us as a church. Of course we may be in different points of the spectrum. We are not thinking the same. But we are around the wheel, connected to the center. We are one. Therefore, live according to this unity. Paul is saying, stop behaving like a baby. Grow up. And then Jesus, this is beautiful, it's so profound, connects our unity to our mission. Because as you know, unity is missional. Jesus is saying, let they be one as we are one, so they can be hanging up on an eternal party in Croatia until I come back again? No. So that, what does your Bible say? So that the world, society, may know what? That you sent me. That indeed, I am the Lord and I am God. Your unity is fully and vitally connected to your mission, according to God himself. And therefore, when Paul is saying, I planted, Apollos watered, God may, is making it grow, he's calling us to unity. Also, he's calling us to humility, which is the path to truth, unity. Come with me to Philippians 2. All the words from the Apostle Paul. Dealing again with division amongst the first followers of Christ. Once again, calling them to unity. Once again, pointing to Jesus as the model of our unity. And calling them and us in Philippians 2 to a radical expression of unity. In verse 3, are you awake back there? Can I see your hands? Great. This side, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. For the Philippians context, that's how a Roman citizen would behave. In a kingdom, in societies that value power, pride, control, and narcissism. But rather, says Paul, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the other. Because that is how a citizen of God's kingdom behave. In a kingdom that values love, altruism, and self-sacrifice. What would it mean to us in Europe today? In your country, with your team, with us in general as a mission? I remember having a humbling conversation with some friends in Indonesia during the Lausanne Younger Leaders Gathering. And I, that night, I recall writing a phrase that described my experience with those friends. When hearts move closer, egos move away. When hearts 
move closer. Egos, move away. Humility, my friends, I know you know this, is essentially a Christian virtue. Please listen up. There is no true unity without humility. Paul is affirming. There is no true gospel without humility. There is no true mission without humility. There is no true church without humility. Because there is no true God without humility. So, Paul continues, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset or attitude as Christ Jesus. Because you are united to Christ. You are His family. Follow His model and example. And we then can almost imagine Paul in his prison and in chains writing the letter to the Philippians. But, but full of holy wonder as he dictates the following words which we find from verses 6 to 11 from Philippians 2. Speaking of Jesus, therefore, who being in nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. The, rather, and notice how impressive the text is, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death and even death on a cross. Therefore, Paul says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. This is the center of gravity to this letter. Paul is communicating a striking message. God is humble. Yes, he is powerful. Yes, he's Lord of Lords. But in Christ, we see that also Christ, God, is humble. And therefore, live out that humility in your relationships, in your groups, in your teams. Vincent de Paul from France wrote centuries ago, Humility is nothing but truth. And pride is nothing but lying. Paul is saying, it is secondary. Who planted? Who watered? Who started the church? Who led the team? Who preached? Who organized? Who went? Who stayed? And by the way, others could have done what we did. Embrace such humility. But God has been making it grow. So stop your division, please. Paul is saying, and embrace the unity and then the humility that we must have as Jesus has expressed. And finally, to finish, these words are a call to rest as well. Just some days ago, as our team were we were having a devotional and a colleague from Nigeria brought a message from Matthew 13, 31 to 33. And as I was studying and preparing for this gathering, the connection struck me as very appropriate. Where Jesus expresses in a parable that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Which a man took and planted in his field. Who planted the seed? A man planted the seed. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Paul, in a way, is echoing Jesus' 
teaching in this parable. Yeah, there is a man who planted, but who made it grow? Who gave the shape, the size, the fruits? And Paul is saying, this must be liberating to us as well. This must give us rest. He is saying, Apollos and I are teammates. We are co-workers. We are servants of God only. But He is the one making the church grow. He is the one expanding the influence of that ministry. He is the one calling others to Himself and to His mission. The shape, the size, the influence... It's God's prerogative. You plant the seed, you water it, and God will make it grow. When, how? Up to Him. Am I the only one who is very concerned about the size, the shape, the influence, the dynamics, the impressions? God through Paul is saying, come on, elder. You plant, others may water. You work together as a team and embrace the unity, living according to it, in humility and rest. Embrace the freedom that you have. I am making it grow. I will give the shape, the influence, the size, and the fruits. Let's talk to God. Hola de nuevo. Gracias por escucharlo. Te invito a que lo compartas con otras personas y que estemos conectados por las redes sociales. Que Dios te guíe y te dé su paz.